grips from the same place that make the same grip on the same ship. So we must push one common intention It's for a better life in the region For we women and we children That must be the ambition of the Caribbean And the Caribbean and the Caribbean Oh, good evening and welcome to another edition of Politics 101, our Open World Podcast edition. Uh, good evening to all of you. Welcome to the program, whether you're joining us from Guyana or you're joining us from the wider Caribbean, North America, welcome. Welcome to those of you who are joining us from Europe, particularly those of you in France and the United Kingdom. Welcome to the program. This is our open word edition. We uh, tend to look at things from the standpoint of economics on uh, these open word programs. And of course, Professor Thomas has been keeping our company over the last couple of months. We would like to thank all of you who have sent in comments about the program. And we are glad that we are able to bring information, but more importantly, to clarify some of these issues for us. We continue to be of service on this program and to add to the conversation, to bring light where there is darkness. So welcome to all of you and keep the comments coming because they help us to improve the program. Well, there is lots been happening on the political and economic front, of course. Uh, front and center is the Venezuelan issue. Venezuela has become quite aggressive in recent weeks, uh, prompting lots of conversation in and out of Guyana, uh, certainly the government of Guyana and the official opposition have met and they are speaking with one voice on this issue, this issue of Guyana's sovereignty. It's an old issue, um, settled in 1899. Venezuela respected that settlement up until the early 1960s as Guyana was moving towards independence. Uh, Venezuela then uh, raised concerns about that 1899 arbitration. The matter is before the International Court of Justice, the ICJ, and uh, uh, all the experts, all the experts are saying that the case is closed. The case was closed in 1899. Well, since Guyana has become a petrol state, the Venezuelans have upped the ante. And the thing is, it's that both the major political players in Venezuela are at one on this issue. In fact, the present opposition, it is, it should be observed, tend to be more hawkish than the ruling party. The fact of the matter is that what is at stake is Guyana's oil and all the other mineral resources in the Essequibo region. Uh, Venezuela is after that. And in recent times with uh, the auction, the recent auction of the oil blocks, we saw Venezuela again, as they say, began sable rattling. What's, what's all this about? This new, this new upsurge, there is talk about a referendum in Venezuela on whether this land, this territory belong to them. The Venezuelan government has asked to meet with the Guyana government. Well, bilateral talks, I'm sure, um, were sounded out in the beginning. And it's the failure of bilateral talks that led the matter to go um, as far as the ICJ. So quite correctly, the Guyana government has not 
acquiesce to the request of the Venezuelan government. So we're going to talk about that with Professor Thomas today and looking at it from the economic standpoint. What does this mean for, the, for Guyana's oil and gas industry? What does it mean uh, for the geopolitical? Because all of this is part of the uh, geopolitics. One remembers that one of the arguments or speculations made uh, about the haste with which the previous government signed the contract with Exxon was uh, to kind of stave off the potential um, incursion by the Venezuelans. We must ask the question, why now again? And with the Americans through Exxon, um, well, well, well entrenched in the oil industry, why the Venezuelans are up in the ante. We'll talk about that. And then we'll, once we have time, we'll pivot to Exxon. And uh, uh, Professor Thomas has asked the question whether Guyana can become a victim of Exxon's own international profile as it relates to its stance on climate change. And of course, what he calls um, uh, its profile as a zombie company, a zombie company. Will that profile have an impact on Guyana's oil and gas industry. Exxon, of course, is the leading investor, the leading company. I, I, I take back the investor because Guyana reminded us a few weeks ago that the, the leading investor is the Guyanese people. Um, but certainly the leading foreign company in the industry is Exxon. Will Exxon's problems, Exxon's negatives, its international negative profile, is that going to affect Guyana? Will Guyana have to fetch Exxon's burden? These are not a question Professor Thomas is going to get into with us. So again, welcome all of you. Welcome all of you to Politics 101. Let's bring in Professor Thomas right away. Professor Thomas, uh, how are you? Good evening, David, I'm fine. Thanks. Okay. Professor, um, you heard my introduction there about Venezuela and whether one is looking at it from uh, pure politics or whether one is looking at it from the standpoint of the political economy or just from the standpoint of economics. Certainly the Venezuela claim um, is central. Um, what's course. your... Let, let's start. Are you surprised that... Uh, in recent times, the Venezuelans have up the ante. No, not at all, um, David. Um, I have written a, at least at least two, two sets of articles in my regular column on the Venezuelan issue. And I consider the Venezuela threat to be an existential threat to Guyana's oil and gas sector. So it's a serious threat. I mean, we talk about it as an important windfall that can remove our people out of poverty. And equally, we have to face the reality that the Venezuelan actions can make all of that disappear. Whether it gets control of the oil for itself or whether it scares off investors, leaving the oil in the ground that some people are wishing and calling for in Guyana, the environmentalists, that might be the outcome. And that I think would be an existential threat, as the existential threat that we cannot overcome. So the stakes are extremely high. I think the problem the government has faced in the articles I wrote before, I, I thought that out of pure happenstance, it, uh, it ended up with Exxon Mobile being the lead contractor in a group that included CNOC, which is a Chinese company. 
So we had two important global players, China and America on our side, implicit in the ownership of the oil that we leased to them under the um, PSA that we have with Exxon Mobil as the contractor. And therefore, we had some important geopolitical strength on the matter. I think that once we agreed to go to the uh, some blocks, it had to be anticipated. And of course, I recognize the dangers of this. Didn't want to articulate it in the public before. When you go to the auction blocks and you begin to wind the circle of owners of the oil, reaching into the European Union by trying to get total involved, reaching into the um, Middle Eastern powers by threatening to get some of the Middle Eastern oil states, petrol states, involved in our local oil, it might give the appearance and I don't want to have to say this as it feels as if we're making um, attempts to sort of set up a situation against Venezuela, because that was never my view of it. That once we began to do that, it would begin to look as if we are deliberately trying to create situations to miniaturize the influence. Of, of Venezuela on the claim, and at the same time, to widen the basis of the international conflict over the claim. I thought it was a very wise thing to do, but the government fell for the noise and nonsense. The people baited them into the local establishment that is against the oil industry, baited them into going into the blocks to show their transparency, quote unquote. And out of the noise came a lot of nonsense. Because in the end now, they've created a situation where the Venezuelan political class could sell it to the Venezuelans that we are undertaking an effort to circumvent the strains under which the present agreement is subject by inviting other territories to become parties to this conflict. And this is a situation I did not want to happen. But of course, you can't articulate such a view because then you give it further to the enemy. But the government, you know, trying to please the gallery, decided to give to the auction without thinking through what it meant for the geopolitics of the oil. And I didn't want to have to say it or warn them because once they were in knowledge of it, public knowledge of it, it would look as if it's deliberate. So it's a very complicated situation now that has emerged. Yeah, Professor, I, I, I want you to spend a little bit more time on the auction and what you're saying, that the way the government went about it, it might have been a mistake. Elaborate it was on a mistake. that. Elaborate, elaborate, elaborate on that. The, the government... Put another, way. Put another way. How would you have gone about it in the circumstances? Well, I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to say how I would have done it, because that in itself is given further to the enemy. Because I think Venezuela are our enemies on this particular matter, and we have to be tactful and we have to be strategic. We can't create a situation that allows Venezuela to tell its people that the government has consciously gone to audit um, to auditing um, the oil blocks, not auditing um, auction, auction the oil blocks, so as to widen the encirclement of Venezuela on the matter and to isolate them internationally. We have to be wiser than that. And there's some things you do in public and some things you do in private, but the government never consults with anybody other than itself. And even among themselves, they only consult with a few. The others follow directions. And so they walk right into the trap, which I'm surprised that it took so long to become manifest. Because it starts from the early days of the um, attempts to open up the oil block bits. 
do they mean some saber rattling? I had a feeling that some of the oil companies who might be bidding might have been worried about the existential threat that I spoke about at the beginning of the um, this conversation. But a government is put in power to govern. And they have to show the wisdom, the diplomacy, the deafness, and the cleverness to defend the interests of Guyana. So they've left us exposed now to such belligerence. We can say Venezuela can shout high and shout low, make all sorts of noise, it will affect us. But we don't want to live in an atmosphere in which the tensions are rising at the same time that we are trying to propel ourselves into a situation where we can try to get rid of our poverty. A greater window of opportunity for the export of oil and gas is narrowing. So the complications of the about what appears to be a simple oversight or just a casual move to oil blocks because people are telling you and teasing you and inciting you with noise about the boisterous boisterous noise about how we have rackets going on and that is why this is the situation has created another difficulty for us which i think we have to try and plot a way out of so that's my view yes professor thomas here making the linkage between the recent public auction and the saber rattling coming from the Venezuelans. And I think this is quite an interesting perspective because it opens up the conversation wider than we think it is. We have, of course, foreign multinational corporations, and they come with um, their own um, issues, some of it which we hopefully will talk about in the second half of the program. We have the environmentalists um, who will come to the subject from their standpoint of, of protecting the environment. And then we have the challenge next door of a country that is making claim to two thirds of our territory. And I think- Three quarters, David. Three quarters of our territory. And the nearest patron, yeah. And I think what I hear you saying is that that factor has not played very much into the calculations of the government as they manage the oil and gas economy. Well, I'm hoping that it, I'm hoping that is accurate. Well, well, well. So, Professor Thomas, um, the genie is out of the bottle. If one goes by what you're saying, what now? What now? Well, I think we have a strong leg to stand on in that. Um, the arbitral award of 1899, is, I think, sound and the argument stands. We seem to be winning on the basis of global opinion. And we have to stick to our guns. But at the same time, we have to think of the transition to that final decision by the ICJ. We don't want to create an, an aura of bellicosity with Venezuela, because ultimately they should be our neighbors. And to make them think that we are so cynical that we would arrange the options to try to find international allies to line up against them is that something that we should not have done. We should not allow ourselves to be taken to be um, bandits. Professor Clark, it, you have to, when you have dealing with contentious issues, you have to respect the position of the people you disagree with. Because that's the only way you're going to solve a problem peacefully. We, our army can't stand up the Venezuelan army. So we don't want to avoid any conflict. And more importantly, they are our neighbors. We have a lot of Venezuelans living here. And that have 
fled here because of the total sum in Venezuela. In fact, what is ailing us is that very turmoil within Venezuela because it's weakening the government, it's weakening the state, and it's weakening the social and military forces that they can command to do what petrol states do in this situation, make war. Because that is why we study petrol states as a unique phenomenon of the globe. Because they feel heady with power and they feel they can solve all problems with force. They can ignore all advances that try to advise them to moderate their behavior. That's what petrol states breed, a feeling of boundless power. And to be able to tame that, you have to really take on the mantle of experience. Because experience shows what petrol states have done and what they do to each other. How they feel that they are invincible. But yet, they, with all the power of oil, unless you have the other powers that go with it, both soft and military, you are not a real power bearer as you think you are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is, 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 is our government correct in not acquiescing to the request by the Venezuelans for bilateral talks? Yeah, I agree with that totally. I, there's nothing to talk about as far as I'm concerned. And that is why I didn't want to put ourselves in a situation where it might look plausibly as if there's something to discuss. What, what are you intending by these auction blocks? Auction blocks. To involve the European Union, to involve the Middle Eastern adventure out in the Caribbean. I, I I am I I am I am quite concerned about part of your comments where you said not only not only would um, the Venezuelan um, uh, 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 saber rattling not only could it lead to direct intervention but that it could scare away investors. Yeah. Speak to that. Speak to that a little bit more for us. Well, that has long been their intention. Uh -huh. From the very beginning, they tried to scare away investors into the hydropower because they were fearful that they would have some costs in the territory that they claim and therefore run the risk of losing a lot of capital work. So that worked very well because it held up some of their efforts to try to get hyperpower here and led the government to trying to do all sorts of maneuvers involving the state itself trying to set up hydropower station within Guyana. Instead of relying on foreign capital and allowing the foreign capital to generate a return on it from the investment they made, what did they do it all? Professor, while, 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 we, while we're talking about hydropower, uh, there's been a spate of blackouts in Guyana yeah, yeah. In, in the last few weeks and a flurry of comments on both sides of the political aisle as to what is responsible for that upsurge in power outages. Um, my God, I mean, almost 60 years after independence, um, my whole lifetime, we have been grappling with this question of blackout. We're now a petrol state. What's going on? What, what, what's going on here? Explain to our audience what, what's, what's, what's really happening here. Well, we've underinvested in the, in the energy sector. We're inefficient in the management of the energy sector. We don't involve the citizens in the production of energy in any meaningful way, except when, when we come to some big decision. They have no stake in the processes by which the energy is generated. The companies don't even want to encourage their own 
staff within the agencies to listen to public complaints. You look, you know, yesterday, well, you probably heard about it. We didn't have for, for at least six hours on the stretch yesterday afternoon. I think from sometime just before midday until just before six. And uh, that is what I was suffering in the 1970s. Yes. And I began to say, <laughs> to say nothing changed. Well, professor, from, uh, from an economic standpoint, how, how does this constant blackout affect the economy? Obviously, it affects the economy negatively. But speak a little bit for us um, on this program about the direct and indirect effect on um, production, productivity, and the overall uh, economy. Well, energy is a vital input to um, every area of, the, of economic life or activity. So any shortfall or mismanagement of the energy sector has a ripple effect throughout the entire economy. It reduces productivity, that is the efficiency with which you produce services and goods. And it does all sorts of other things that are negative. Right now, today is the day since Friday where my television service was cut off and it's today is fixed. My internet was off, as you know, a few weeks back. It took about five to six days to get it back in service. Even though when I call my name, people are very helpful. Or they sound very helpful. But they are fighting against constraints too. I, I, I have, take service from a company which has a remote that they gave to me since 2014. And this remote has not been working for the past year. And I can't get a replacement remote. They just say, wait, they have to come and this and that. They, they keep lending me some part-time thing from time to time. The family, everybody called them. Because if you had any real operational research system or system within the um, company, they would know when to order new remotes. And that's something that has to happen and then you order. You know that the remote has a life of, let's say, of seven years or five years. You, you pre-order. So you, your customers are now faced with this. But the company don't care. If, if I fight hard enough, they would probably tell me, they can give me a concession on the, on the time that I don't have the remote. But the convenience I'm paying for because I need it. Yeah. Yeah. In case you're just joining us, it's our open word edition of Politics 101. We're talking about the Venezuelan threat, the recent upsurge in the... Um, rhetoric coming out of Venezuela. Uh, we're talking about the blackouts in Guyana and their impact on the overall economy um, of the country. The disruption to normal life in Guyana. And Professor Thomas, of course, um, lays the blame on the management, the management and the lack of the lack of investment in the energy sector. Professor, the government has been saying that this gas, the sure thing, would solve the problem of energy. Well, Is that say, investment in the let energy me say, sector? They've been saying that about GPL. Um, 20 years ago, I remember that clear, clearly. You need new investment, the IDB will give a loan, blah, blah, blah. There are always solutions around the corner. And the solutions never come. So I'm not going to sit down and wait. I have I want to see. Fortunately, because of those days, I still have a generator under my house. Mm. And I'm ashamed to tell people I have to resort it now and again, twice already for this week. 
Yes. Just to Professor, survive the basic things we need. Yeah. Professor, before we move over to Exxon, um, as one of the hats you've worn um, during your career is that of the trade unionists. You were at one time um, the president of the uh, union, the UGW, UGSA and then UGWU later yeah. on, and you were also a member of the TUC. We have had the recent development where teachers have been trying to, the Guyana um, Teachers Union has been trying to get the government to negotiate pay raises. The president this week did something unprecedented, I would say. He called the teachers together and in effect, I'm saying to the teachers, in lieu of pay raises, um, he's going to give them allowances. Now, does that not raise the question of floating collective bargaining agreements, which the government has signed on to? Of course it does, but, but of course, what you'll also find is that the teachers make a calculation of which is preferable. They're hoping the allowances won't have taxes. So they would um, be saving and getting more income out of it, real cash income, um, because they will have to pay any taxes with it. That's what I'm hoping they're planning to do. I don't know. Yes, that's what that's what some of the teachers have been saying. But uh, should we not separate this whole question of allowances from the certainly for wages? Certainly, we should. Um. In any orderly trade union situation, wage payments should be made for the work contributed based on the contract for work. Allowances and so on are, are added on, but still essential because they are part of the contract. But some trade unions may be bargain. I don't know that for this particular case. They might bargain and figure that if they get house allowances and land or whatever it is, that makes up for cash. I don't know the circumstances. I don't know if that's true. But that argument I know has been made as a trade unionist. Yes, 60 years. But you see, I think that um, one of the difficulties which we face is that um, the IMF and the World Bank have definitely been recommended to the government that they don't expand public sector pay. So the paradox is that even though we, the government has more ability to pay teachers, any employee in the public sector, their argument is that you slow down the rate of growth of that pay because public employment is wasteful use of money compared to private employment. Mm -hmm. and so when we argue for a um, boxing proposal, that is added on also the wasteful use of money. They want the, and the payments to be um, going through regular social assistance mechanisms or not at all, and certainly not to government employment, because they consider that to be wasteful. And there's some evidence of that, because governments do have people as employed poor, give them job just for the sake of job. We have a blackout here. I hope you do not notice it. There it yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. P Professor? Um. Let's let's turn our attention now to Exxon. Over the last two weeks in the in your column, Guyan and the Wider World, yeah. um, uh, in the Stabrook News, you have been dealing with the question of uh, what I would loosely call uh, uh, Exxon's liabilities, not liabilities in terms of funds, but in terms of the the, the, the global profile. Yeah. Um, and that Guyana could become enmeshed um, in those negatives um, that 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 ExxonMobil 
uh, has brought uh, uh, to the fore. And you uh, have identified ExxonMobil as uh, a zombie company. Now, first of all, let's, let's, let's look at the broad question of how the liabilities of a major investor in an in industry um, that the country in which it's investing can um, over time come to have to fetch the burden of that industry? Well, what happens and if that happens? Yeah. It means that the country, which is Ghana, that we're talking about, yes. has become such a strategic source of value to the company that they can end the zombie status. Because zombification of a company is not a terminal phase. Companies can remain zombies for decades. And they can have a turnaround. And the turnaround has been evident in um, um, Excel Mobile since 20, 2021, third quarter, going into 2022 and continuing now, based largely on the returns and the profits out of Guyana. From Guyana, sorry. Professor, if I may stop you, I, I, I should have asked you um, the question first. What is a zombie company? When one talks about a, a zombie company, what is a zombie company? A company which really doesn't earn enough free flowing cash to generate investments of its own back into the industry. And where it's moving and surviving on debt and borrowing from banks and institutions from day to day without any hope of being able to pay back out of the organic growth of the company. So they have to keep borrowing or they have to hope for some handout or something exceptional to happen. And since the United States government does not give handouts, they have to find a new investor that will yield such profits that the books will read that they're generating enough to support their own internal investment and growth. It's come because companies borrow after the form in which they have their principal investments in, generate a surplus enough to invest in the company. And they borrow to add to that for forward expansion of the company. But a company like Exxon lives and borrow debt all the time. And that has been going on for many years. And but in the 2020s, in 2021, the third quarter, it changed. And this has been attributed to, in many cases, and I have in the articles, if you look at the back issues, I wrote a long series of the zombification of Exxon going on for months. Um, and that is the source of the survival of, of um, Exxon. Because we live to undertake that reversal based on the um, the successful investments in Guyana. So, 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 so your argument is that for a long time Exxon has been a zombie company. And... Fact, if, you, if you look, if you look at any economics book or any Google zombie company, almost always the first example you get is Exxon Mobil. At the time I wrote the articles in 2021, 22, Exxon Mobil was the first item or company most often listed as an example of what a good zombie company is. It's a term that originated largely in Japan when they had that last decade of investments. Yeah. And the secular decline in the manufacturing sector was so serious that the companies were not able to generate enough internal funds to ensure that they could expand. They had to rely on borrowing from the banks and they had to rely on external funding. Mm -hmm. So if, 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 if the suggestion is that uh, 
Uh, Exxon is wriggling its way out of that zombie status, largely because of its investment in Guyana, the returns from its investment or prospective returns from its investment in Guyana. Um, does that not make Guyana strategic for Exxon? And should that not in turn um, strengthen the bargaining hand of the government of Guyana? It should strengthen the bargaining hand of the government of Guyana. Of that I'm sure. But um, the question is um, you have to be able to negotiate well. Because while you save them the zombification, they can continue in that status for a longer period of time than they have in the past. So they hold a lot of cards. It's not as if it's a simple thing. Mm -hmm. And basically, they have the technology, and we don't have it. They have the scale of finance where we can't even bring one well to productive production. We don't have enough capital funds invested in institutions of all of them to finance the operations of one well. So we're in a hole where we can't help ourselves, where we also have to negotiate strategically. And that is why I say that we should establish a national company so that we are also thinking of strengthening our hole going beyond that of being the contractor. You want to be a contractor and a lead operator. As Exxon, we can't become an Exxon because we don't have the operational skill. We want to be on the table where the decisions are made. We want to be able to develop the technology and or at least know about it in a much clearer way. The operational issues involved in our industry, we become completely um, knowledgeable of it as much as the company itself, even though we don't have the finance to be able to invest in our, on our own, and therefore to be able to make more efficient and effective decisions. Because a lot of our decisions are made on the basis of what they report to us. We have no operational expertise inside the company. And so we deal with them as a set group of operators who are sending their reports to us that we have to evaluate. And skillful as we are, and skillful as might be the help we get, that can't replace first-hand experience and being at the table when the decisions are made. And that is why it's absolutely essential, I think, for Guyana to become or to set up a national company that invests some of its resources that it generates from the blocks for financing a seat at the table. That the other operators, like HES, which is an independent operator, brings a lot of capital today, but there also there's also room for junior investments in the area. And I think that's what we should set about to do. Professor Clive Thomas, you're making the case for a national oil company, um, uh, drawing attention to the fact that uh, while um, Exxon uh, is benefiting from Guyana's oil in the sense that um, it is uh, moving from a zombie company that lives hand to mouth to use a Guyanese term to know a company that is above water, that while that may strengthen the hand of our government in bargaining, it's not as cut and dry as that because Exxon still has the technology. It points to the complexity of this oil and gas industry, this, pet this status as a petrol state. That it's, it's not, these discourses are not as simple as uh, um, some people are making them out to be. Professor, um, the profile of Exxon Mobil, as far as uh, climate change is concerned, is not one that the company would be proud of. 
and you are the company may be proud of it, you know, but it's not no, one. Well, yes, not one that's shameful a... one. Put it that way, it's a shameful, shameful one. Shameful they're one. Considered, they're considered warriors against climate change. They're not against climate change, they're warriors against climate activism. They've and lied. We, yeah. Are they're we at risk in Guyana of 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 be um, tarnished with that reputation. Be yes. tarnished with that reputation. Yes. There was a something that a program that was produced recently by their um, social outreach um, people, which gave the impression that Guyana was was supportive of um, what Exxon Mobile was doing. And the sentiment in Guyana is not that. Sentiment in Guyana recognizes that um, Exxon Mobil is here to make money. They're making money, and that is why they're here. They're not here out of love of Guyanese. So there's no um, possibility that they could be seen as anything else. But an exploiting corporation. And that is the fate that we have had to live with again because of pure happenstance. But the circumstances that have eventuated include CNOC, which is a Chinese company, even though they have their own capitalistic orientation. They provide, I think, an opportunity for some elements of Guyanese negotiation and influence on the behavior of the corp of the comp the, uh, the whole group, the co-venturers together. They, they have an opportunity to do that. Plus, there is also within that group the Hess Corporation, which itself may become arrival to Exxon. They are a small player in the thing, although they're not a small player in terms of shares. But they are anxious to build their stake. So with a company of our own, we have two potential social allies to work with or to work through in dealing with Exxon. And that is why I think it's be stupid of us not to have that cooperation. That even though the Chinese will want to back, China will want to back the Chinese company, and the Americans will want to back the American company, they have two companies here. And we don't know the strength of the various voices. I mean, Exxon will be much more powerful than this. But Hess is a rival. Hess is a threat. Hess could be a potential disruptor. We don't know. It's up to us as skillful political class to be able to define our interests so well that we seek to see how we can play these forces that are off against each other. But we lump everything into Exxon. We take no consideration the flexibility that exists for us as a consequence, nobody ever talks about seeing them as three distinct corporations. In fact, when they give information, it has to give the most. But I don't think CNOC has a vested interest in secrecy. But then this government has a political section in the foreign ministry. They should be negotiating with CNOC in China, Beijing talking to them and trying to find out what is happening. Because they don't keep secrets from each other, because each other put a lot of money in. The share that is distributed where Exxon Mobile is not the majority shareholder. And therefore, we have to be able to be so such skillful managers of the process mm -hmm. that we do not Ignore that fact 
that there's no dominant operator. There's a lead operator. And they all concede to the leadership. But not the lead owner. And you know money talks. That's right. That's right. Professor Clive Thomas here, uh, walking us through some of the issues of the day. We have been discussing Exxon and uh, Exxon's profile, its global profile, and how that may tarnish the um, uh, image of Guyana, um, especially when we see the way in which the government is dealing quite uncritically with Exxon um, that leads some of its detractors to say that um, the government is in bed with Exxon and looking after the interest of Exxon as against the interests of its country. Professor Thomas has called uh, for a national oil company to give us a bigger stake and a bigger say in the industry. The government has not address that issue. It seems to be reluctant to go that direction. Professor Thomas, why do you think the government is reluctant towards to, um, going the direction of a national oil company? Well, I would imagine it's part of the common rejection of so many other things that we recommend, including the boxing proposal. Yeah. Even though it's staring them in their face as the obvious route to go. Yes, and 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 certainly uh, the situation is one in which it's the management, the management of the oil and Economy. gas industry that is at question here. That the government is not doing a good job at managing the. And there's an arrogance about it. Um, only they have the right to speak of it. Yes. And, and, and that's the risk of an authoritarian of culture, an authoritarian state. Um, as, as the country moves towards a petrol state, they come they back. They don't respect other people, though. No. Yeah, 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 yeah. Professor, you uh, have talked, um, you have written extensively for decades on the authoritarian state uh, uh, in the periphery, as you called it, back in 1984 when you published that seminal work. And you saw the authoritarian state as an endurance to economic development then. We are now into a petrol state. Do you still hold that view? I still hold that view, very much so. I mean, everything the government has done is um, exaggerated that style of, money, of um, operation in the economy since then. They've um, said, said clearly to the public, like it or leave it. There's no um, room for interaction. There's absolutely no exchange of points of view. You can have Venezuela, Venezuelan House of Assembly making those declarations you don't even convene a national consultation to bring your people up to date. And if you can, if they do concede an operation, a national consultation, they can want to steer it as a PPPC consultation, which means you defeat the whole purpose. They don't see the ways in which you could build a sense of national well-being national cooperation in some of these tasks, which is absolutely essential to, for progress. We can't get progress unless we come to some common understanding of how we can deal with issues. And we should discuss these things to create the conditions for people being involved in sharing. But sharing and consultation has to be organized to be um, worthwhile as far as they're concerned. Be worthwhile as far as they're concerned. Professors, we go out, you know, I was hearing recently of 
um, going in, people going into the supermarket in Guyana and seeing okros, for example, being imported from yes. from Asia. What's what's going on? Everyone. What's going on? <laughs> Professor, you, you, you the thing is, 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 but this tremendous scope in Ghana for real diversification of agriculture, and also speak to you all about it later. And, and even food, those three industries have struck me. Just trying to follow the news and follow the um, bits that I pick up. And it's an effort as having tremendous, tremendous potential. And I think that um, we underestimate them to our peril. <coughs> we underestimate them to our peril. Professor Clive Thomas, thank you. <coughs> thank you again for um, spending the time with us this week and walking no us problem. through some of the pertinent issues. And we will see you next week. Yes, David. Thank you very much, Professor Clive Thomas, there. Ending on that note, my God, I hear okra is coming from here, Thailand or somewhere like that. Um, look, look, the problem of management is, 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 is the big problem in, in Guyana. I am not saying that we should not pay attention to Exxon and these international companies and what they're doing. We have done so today. Professor Thomas um, talked about us, um, uh, uh, in a sense, uh, being tarnished by the liabilities of Exxon and uh, the fact that Exxon is making money from Guyana and uh, pulling itself out of the, zombie the zombification that it found itself in. So it is not that we are not critical of um, the foreign companies and uh, their role in the country and their threat to the well-being of the country. But we also believe that there should be equal attention on the way the government is managing the resources that are coming from oil. And we heard Professor Thomas here today saying that perhaps that uh, public auction was not uh, a good thing, after all. And what it points to is that the government did not take pay sufficient attention to that other important factor, that other imp important variable, and that is Venezuela. Venezuela is our neighbor. Venezuela has a claim to our territory. And Venezuela is in a position not just as a lot of us has been saying, the threat of them walking over the border and invading Guyana, but the threat of chasing away investors. One way or the other, that Venezuelan threat is existential, as Professor Thomas said, and, and so it would have an effect, an existential effect on what is going on in the oil and gas industry and by extension, what is going on in the wider economy. Because the big growth that we are seeing is really the growth of the oil and gas industry. And so we have a government that is not paying sufficient attention to all the factors involved. I see a lot of these youngsters jumping around as oil and gas experts. And some of them may have gone to school and study economics and have a degree or two in economics, but they have little sense of political economy, little sense of geopolitics. One of them I heard on a program, they asked him to define democracy and he couldn't. He said that's not his forte. His forte is an economist. Well, we grew up, I grew up, we grew up, knowing our economists were all developmental economists, political economists. And so this government finds itself not being able to manage the economy, not being able to manage the oil and gas industry.
And when you add to that, it's penchant for domination. It's authoritarian instincts. Then we are in really bad shape. If the government doesn't see the importation of things like okra and so on into our country as a problem and what it could do, then I don't know. The prices in the market, the prices, of course, people have been talking about that. Professor Thomas has told us it's a function of the market. But what is the government doing? Surely the government can do things to cushion the effect of those high prices. The Buxton proposal is on the table. The proposal for a structured cash transfer to the people of Guyana. The government itself has admitted that going around and sharing out cash grants here and there, it's not a developmental tool. And we don't want to say that if the government is sharing out a handout here and there, that uh, you know um, people should not take the handouts. But we are saying that that is not a sustainable developmental path. Clearly, structured cash transfers to people, and we have the option of a conditional transfer linking the transfer to school attendance, the attendance at health clinics, and so on, so that it's part of a larger developmental plan. I make bold to say that it is the only serious policy initiative that has been put on the table since we've become a petrol state in terms of the distributive aspect of the revenues that we're getting from oil. We are not against spending on the infrastructure. We are not against modernization in that sense. We are not against infrastructure development, but man shall not live by bread alone. A country cannot develop just by only developing its infrastructure. You have to invest equally in people. You have to invest equally in the future. We do not believe that you put money, all your money or most of your money in the bank for a rainy day. We believe that you invest that money today with the future in mind. The transfer from the transition from fossil fuel to renewables, that is investment in the future. That is investment in a rainy day. Our proposals are on the table. The Buxton proposal for cash transfer, investment in research and development, as far as the renewables are concerned, investment in agriculture and other pivotal aspects of our traditional economy, a national oil company, these are proposals that the WPA has put on the table. And it's up to the government. But this kind of spiteful, bad-minded politics, where if your opponents put something on the table, you do not consider it because it comes from them, is certainly not leading us in the right direction. We will continue to plug away. We will continue to discuss these issues and to make them available to the government and to the people of the country. Thank you all very much for coming through another day. And I'll see you all tomorrow. One race from the same place that make the same trip on the same ship. So we must push one common intention. It's for a better life in the region for the woman.